much for coming. Um, thanks to the Chicago Community Festival for inviting me. I can see I've missed out on an opportunity to have an exciting travel experience since I'm being brought in from two floors up. Um, I missed my free flight on Southwest. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, getting ripped off. But anyway, um, this is. <laughs> um, that's okay. Uh, I'm glad that Southwest is doing this. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the creation of humane societies, and uh, which are societies for the protection of animals and children in the United States. And I'm going to begin with a story. I want to take you back to New York City in uh, the winter of 1873, to the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood, which back in 1873, as it remained until at least 1973, was not a very good neighborhood to live in. Um, my story has three principles. Um, it begins with this woman who I can't get a good picture of, but her name is Etta Wheeler. And she was what was called in the 19th century a church-friendly visitor. She attended St. Luke's Parish in New York City. And she would go out uh, and kind of tend to the souls, as well as the, some of the material needs of uh, poor parishioners of the church living in Manhattan. And there was a woman who she routinely visited who was uh, in the advanced stages of tuberculosis, lying on her deathbed, as Etta Wheeler tells the story. And this woman, this elderly sick woman, reported to Wheeler that uh, she heard the cries of a child night and day coming through the walls separating her apartment from the neighboring apartment. And she wanted Wheeler to go next door, knock on the door, and see what was going on. And Wheeler reported that she felt like she had to do this for this dying woman. So she went next door, she knocked on the door, and as Wheeler tells the story, she was greeted by a woman who opened the door, you know, just enough for her to get a, a, a peek inside, but she was not admitted to the apartment. Uh, you know, this woman wanted to know, what are you doing? Uh, Wheeler said, well, you know, I heard there may be something going on here. The woman who opened the door didn't want to let her in, but Wheeler said, you know, I could see through the crack in the door a small child in the kitchen washing dishes washing a pan as large as herself. And I could see on her body the marks of abuse. And I could see she was wearing rags. And I could see a whip on the table nearby. So Wheeler saw all of this, took it all in through the crack in the door, and felt like there was a situation here and that she needed to try to do something about it. So she told the story years later. She said, I went back to the priest at St. Luke's and I told him. And he said, well, go, go to the charities, you know, go to the, uh, the charities that exist in, in the city for children. She went to them and they said, there's nothing we can do. You know, we take care of children that are brought to us. So the orphanages uh, that existed in the city at the time, which would have been the main institutions for children. You know, we can only take care of a child who's dropped on our doorstep, so to speak. Uh, so Wheeler went to the police, and they said, well, this is, this is hearsay. You know, this is, we need evidence. We can't do anything about this. So Wheeler went home, and she's telling the story to her family. And her niece is there. And her niece says, well, why don't you go to Mr. Berg? for surely the little girl is an animal. And Mr. Berg, this guy over here, Henry Berg, had uh, founded the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in New York City, the ASPCA, in 1866. So this is 1873. His organization has been around uh, for seven years, and it's gotten a tremendous amount of press. Uh, so everyone knows about Mr. Burke, right? And uh, Wheeler, in her desperation, presumably, she's been unable to find help anywhere else, she says, okay, sure, I'll go to Mr. Burke. 
So she goes to Mr. Burke, and this was not the first time that the ASPCA had been approached by citizens of New York City about a case of child abuse. It was, however, the first time that Berg and his, the lawyer for the ASPCA decided to act. So they obtained a writ that removed Mary, the girl, this girl, Mary Ellen Wilson, from her home. And they were able to bring uh, the perpetrators of her abuse, who were not in fact her parents, uh, into court uh, and uh, the, the woman who answered the door was uh, sent to jail. So this is a picture of Mary Ellen that was taken uh, at, right after she was removed from her home. So she was taken out, brought to the offices of the ASPCA, and they took this photograph of her to document uh, the abuse that she had suffered. Now, in the wake of the rescue of Mary Ellen Wilson and the successful prosecution of her abuser, Berg and uh, the ASPCA's lawyer, a man named Elbridge Jerry, got together and founded a new organization, which they called the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Right? It's exactly the same as the SPCA, except you put a C at the end. So they formed, they had an SPCA and they had an SPCC, right? So child protection grew out of this animal protection organization. And as both animal and child protection spread from New York City across the country, an interesting pattern developed, which was that in most places, this, the New York City pattern of having a separate SPCA and a separate SPCC did not hold, rather animal and child protection were joined under the same institutional mantle. And these organizations usually went by the name of a humane society. So in Chicago we have the Illinois Humane Society, was one of the first and, and largest humane societies in the country, and it for many, many years did both animal and child protection. Um, so the question that arose for me when I encountered this story as a historian was, you know, what were, what were people thinking, right? This seems bizarre. Both that animal protection would precede child protection, right? That shocks modern sensibilities. And that they would be joined into the same organization, right? It seems like animal protection and child protection are very different kinds of uh, projects involving very different kinds of beings with very different kinds of problems. So I had to ask myself what sense this made. It obviously made a lot of sense in the, in the 19th century because it happened in lots and lots of places because Etta Wheeler went to Henry Burr. She wasn't the first one to do it, right? Um, and she wasn't the last. A lot of SPCAs ended up doing child protection because people brought them cases of child abuse. And uh, they, they took it on. And then I asked myself also, what difference did it make? You know, why is this story important of the relationship between animal and child protection? And so what I want to do in the time that remains is to talk about both of those. What sense it made if we think like 19th century Americans and what difference it made uh, both then and now. So what sense did it make? One of the assumptions underlying, you know, sort of Ed Edda Wheeler's niece saying, why don't you go to Henry Berg? and underlying the entire kind of conjunction of animal and child protection is that animals and children are similar kinds of beings. They have some important things in common. One of the most basic of these is that they're both helpless creatures, defenseless creatures, creatures who can't look out for their own interests, right, that need uh, protection. And I think this vision of animals and children as both being helpless is really 
uh, well illustrated by this seal of the American Humane Association. So the American Humane Association, which does both animal and child protection, is established in 1877, and uh, it still exists today. This is uh, the seal that is uh, developed for the AHA in the 19th century. And it has on the one side, this is Minerva. She's holding up a shield to protect children you know, from this perpetrator of abuse, a man wielding a club. Uh, and then you have a similar scene over here of an angel coming down to, again, stop a man with a raised club from beating a horse, right? So this uh, image conveys this assumption, right, that both of these kinds of beings are helpless, right? They need protectors um, to come down and, and intervene to help them. They're not capable of doing it themselves. So that's, you know, kind of one of the, the basic assumptions underlying this. Um, link between animals and children. Um, but there's more to it. Um, not only was Etta Wheeler not the only one who had the idea to bring a case of child protection to an animal protection organization, but you know, once I started looking in 19th century publications, at 19th century uh, illustrations, at um, literature from the 19th century, I found out that uh, this kind of equation of animals and children was really widespread um, before the time that Etta Wheeler acted and after. So uh, this is a painting which is on the cover of my book um, and it was reprinted everywhere in the late 19th century. Uh, uh, animal protection organizations used it in their uh, literature, in their magazines, in their pamphlets, in their annual reports, but um, People had reprints of this in their parlors. Um, it, was, it was the kind of print that circulated quite widely, and um, it's by a man named George Augustus Holmes, and it really illustrates sort of three of the things that 19th century Americans believed animals and children had in common. One of these was that children are like animals. And if any of you have children, you know what I'm talking about, right? This is, um, but, so before the 19th century, in the 18th century, in the 17th century, the animal nature of children was disturbing to people. Colonial Americans tried very, very hard to keep their children from crawling. They, they, they uh, you know, put them... In these, up, in these walking stools, kind of like the equivalent of contemporary walkers, but they did this so that the, the babies would never crawl, because going on four legs is what animals do. And there was this kind of fear that, you know, because children begin as little animalistic beings, if you allow them to crawl, they're kind of never going to get to become fully human and to become fully civilized. So this fear of of, of never kind of recovering from the fall into animality. And this idea, although it fades, people accept crawling beginning in the early 19th century as a normal developmental stage and fear it less, but the, this assumption that children are kind of consumed by their bodies, right? That, that their bodies are more present, more active than their minds and that this makes them closer to animals, persists. So uh, in the 19th century, if you called a child precocious, that wasn't a compliment. That meant their mind was uh, overtaking their bodily development, and that could be harmful, right? So, uh, and there was a fear of precociousness, right? This, so there's an assumption that it's normal for children to be uh, consumed by their bodies, driven by their bodies. Uh, up to a certain point, right? And, and so that makes them more like animals. So we have this crawling child, right? This is the child as an animal. But we also have the dog on the same plane as the child, right? So the other, the flip side of this 
is that animals are like children. Okay, so this is the other assumption that people have in the 19th century. Not just that children are a little bit animalistic, but also that animals are like children. Um, there was a uh, 19th century author who said, you know, to have a, a pet is, is like having a perpetual baby in the house. So, um, and this goes along with the rise of pet keeping as a kind of common middle class practice, which really starts to take hold in the United States in the years before the Civil War, so the kind of first half of the 19th century. And pet keeping is seen as uh, a way to you know, bring this dependent being into the house. Um, the pet, like the child, becomes an object of emotional investment on the part of the family, right? A kind of uh, form of emotional glue uh, becomes a center a family feeling and family life. Uh, so there's this uh, way that, that uh, animals begin to be equated to children as perpetual babies, right? They never grow up. Um, they'll always be dependent. And um, if you want to have that kind of relationship uh, continue past when your children grow up, you can always get a dog. Um, so here they are, looking into each other's eyes, and here's the cat, a similar being coming around the corner. They're all on all fours. And the title of this is Can't You Talk? But it's very unclear who's asking this question. <laughs> Seriously, this is a baby. The baby can't talk. This is a dog. The dog can't talk. This is a cat. The cat can't talk, but what's being communicated here is that these two want to communicate with each other, right? And in some ways, it's being suggested that each is asking the question of the other. The baby is asking the dog, you know, why aren't you talking to me? And the dog is asking the baby, why aren't you talking to me? And this is kind of the third way in which people think that animals and children are similar, that there's something about their subjectivity, there's some kind of space they inhabit together that is different from the adult human world. Um, and this shows up in all kinds of places in the 19th century, not just in this print, but in the fact that there are talking animals in children's books. Why are there talking animals in children's books? Not just because children are more likely to believe that animals can talk, uh, but also because it's, there's an assumption that children somehow relate to animals as peers, right? And this is another reason to have a pet in your home, right? It's like having a friend for your child. This is another one of the operating assumptions. Um, it's also seen in the idea that, um, you know, there's a lot of stories in 19th century magazines about the lonely child, the lonely boy or girl who doesn't have a friend, but then uh, goes out into the forest and becomes friends with a deer, or uh, is out on the farm and becomes friends with a cow, right? So there's just um, all kinds of evidence that people believed that um, there was some kind of emotional connection that animals and children can make with each other that neither one of them can make with adult humans. So this is the kind of shared space of subjectivity that I think many believed animals and children had together. Um, the other thing that animals and children had in common, people in the animal and child protection movement believed, was that the people who abused them were the same kinds of people. That cruelty to animals and cruelty to children comes from the same dark place in the human heart. So there was, uh, this is a quote, he is cruel to his beast, will abuse even his own child. And this is um, actually from a speech given by 
the president of the Illinois Humane Society in the 1870s, and he's expressing really kind of common wisdom of the late 19th century, that there's a slippery slope of violence, that if you are cruel to an animal, pretty soon your cruelty, your violence, is going to manifest itself in human society. You're going to act against humans. This was an assumption that predates animal and child protection. You can find, you know, thinkers in the 16th century like Montaigne expressing this view. And it's one that well outlasts it. I mean, one of the profiles for a sociopath to this day is uh, childhood abuse of animals, right? So there's a sense that there's some kind of profile here um, that if you start with animals, you're going to end with humans. So that there's, uh, if you take action against animal abuse or child abuse, you're kind of shutting down uh, a form of violence that that will has the capacity to spread um, beyond its original targets. By the same token, or the flip side of that, is that in the mid-19th century, new ideas about how to best discipline animals and children are taking root, and they're the same ideas. Um, these ideas about discipline are kind of shuttling back and forth across the species line between humans and animals. So in the beginning in the early 19th century, there's a craze of, uh, for horse whisperers who go around performing in towns showing that you can, you don't need to break a horse, right? Um, you can, what uh, they call it, uh, gentling a horse, taming it and training it through gentling rather than breaking. So instead of whipping the horse and beating it, you're basically going to use positive reinforcement. And um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea that people also used to believe that you had to break a child's will, right? The same language, the same concepts. Well, uh, the ideas about gentling rather than breaking as a mode of discipline also crops up in discussions of how to discipline children. So here's a um, example. Uh, this is the frontispiece, or the, the front picture uh, from a book by Jacob Abbott, published in 1871. It's called Gentle Measures in the Management and Training of the Young. And that language of gentle measures is taken directly from horse training. And what Abbott proposes in the book is that you can gentle people as well as gentle horses. Um, and what I think is so interesting about this frontispiece picture is that um, he's, uh, it's titled Authority, right? And what you see here is this couple, they're kind of pulling up to their house, and uh, the horse is pulling them. There's a child sitting up here on the porch, and um, what's kind of suggested is that they have gentled the horse, Right? They have authority over the horse, but they're gentle people. They've gentled the horse rather than beaten it into submission. And here they have this child obediently waiting for them as well. They have authority over the child as well through gentle methods, which you know, you'll learn all about if you read this handy-dandy parenting manual. Um, so there's uh, not only a sense that you know, bad people act against both animals and children, but good people act the same towards animals as they would towards children. They gentle rather than, than break them. And um, the, <laughs> the other uh, kind of one of the other key assumptions here is uh, that if animals can have rights, then children can too. So one of the things that uh, is attributed, a, a saying that's attributed to Henry Berg, although it's perhaps apocryphal, but um, newspaper reports at the time of the rescue of the little girl, Mary Ellen Wilson, say, quote Henry Berg as saying, uh, the child is an animal. If she doesn't have rights as a human, let her at least have the rights of the cur in the street. Okay, so she doesn't have rights as a person, we're going to give her the rights of the stray dogs that, that we, the ASPCA, protect. Now, uh, in the years leading up to Mary Ellen's rescue, 
1873 and continuing after that, animal protectionists worked really hard to convince the American public that animals had some kinds of rights, right? And they spoke in this language of rights. And I think that's, that's really important um, for a number of reasons, right? It's one of the reasons that that a Wheeler can go to Henry Berg and not to a charity, right? Because what they say is they're not doing something charitable here. They're not taking pity on animals and children. They're defending their rights. But in order to defend the rights of animals and children, you've got to do some intellectual footwork. You've got to redefine what it means to have rights, and you've got to redefine who can have them if you're operating in the 1870s, right? So classically, in 17th and 18th century liberal political theory, and I mean sort of small l liberal, not liberal in today's political terms, those people who had rights were normally thought to possess them because they were rational or in a in a particular polity because they own property. So on the face of it, neither one of these things applies to animals, and neither one of them applies to children. Children are potentially rational, but as we've just discussed, you know, most people see them as engulfed by their bodies um, until they come become mature. Um, some people would defend the rationality of animals but you don't want to have to depend on that. So animal protectionists have done a great deal of work to say, animals have rights because they have feelings. And their feelings are like our feelings. They're like humans' feelings. They feel the same pains that we do. They suffer, right? And that's what this kind of funny cartoon from the uh, lovely animal protection journal, Our Dumb Animals, dumb here meaning mute, unable to speak. That's an expression of their helplessness, right? Um, uh, is turnabout fair play? So what do we have here? We have uh, men in harness, yoked up to a cart, pulling other men who are bound, whose feet and, and hands are bound, right, as uh, stock would be on their way to the stockyards in a city being whipped to go faster, faster, faster. Um, and it's turned about fair play, right? And the text that accompanies this cartoon in Our Dumb Animals says, you know, spells it out. If you don't think this looks fun, then why would you think an animal would enjoy it? If you think this would be painful for you, then assume that it's painful for the oxen. Assume that it's painful for whatever kind of stock. Pigs, sheep are uh, bound and tied and tossed in a pile in the back of a cart, right? So what they're saying here in, in this and all kinds of other of their propaganda is animals have the same feelings we do. That's why they have rights, okay? Now when it comes to linking animal with child protection, this is a very important piece of background. Right? Because if animals can have rights based on their feelings, not on their rationality, not on their ownership of property, which entitles them to a say in governance, but simply on their capacity to feel, then so can children, right? They can also be included in that, in the group, in the kind of community of, of beings that, that have rights that have to be respected. Um, so this is just another illustration here of, um, also from Our Dumb Animals, of the kinds of techniques, sorry, that um, animal protectionists use to try to establish this emotional equivalence between humans and animals, right? And that they were really putting that at the foundation of their, of their claims and that they could then ap apply this to children, so here's not only do animals suffer pain, but they have the same positive kinds of feelings we do. They have family feelings, right? When you take a, a uh, calf away from its mother in the public uh, stockyards to sell the calf and to sell the mother, 
they feel sad when they're separated from each other, right? They love each other. So these are making these, these kinds of arguments. Um, the other reason why it makes sense to join animal and child protection is not only because people think animals and child children are similar kinds of beings, and not only because animal protectionists have crafted this language of rights where they're based in the capacity to feel, but also because of the kinds of institutions, the kinds of organizations that animal protectionists created. They were different from charities, right? And what made them different was not only that they spoke a language of rights, but that they were deputized with police powers. So uh, they were given the power to make arrests and uh, bring the accused, the perpetrators that they were accusing before magistrates, before courts of law, and uh, to try them. And this is what made Henry Berg the right choice for Etta Wheeler, right? Yes, because the child was like an animal. Yes, because she was a little helpless being, but also because he already had an organization with officers that dressed up like this, with policemen dressed up like policemen and had badges and went around the streets of New York City and could make arrests and knew how to bring people up on charges, right? So they've created a new kind of hybrid public-private organization that has police powers but uh, and that can act on behalf of what they would call, right, the rights of the defenseless. Um, so here they are standing in front of the ASPCA building. And uh, that made them really different from any other kind of organization that was around at the time. Right? It's one of the things that made them really different. They didn't just talk about rights, but as they saw it, they enforced them. They called themselves the arm of the law or the arm of the state constantly. This is how they referred to themselves. Um, they said, you know, we're private, but we we extend the arm of the law and we extend the arm of the state outward into places where it might not otherwise get, it might not otherwise be. And this is really uh, important for why it makes sense to combine animal with child protection. If you want to have that same capability for children, you can see from Etta Wheeler's experience that there really wasn't any kind of organization that could do this for children. But here's a model of an organization that can do it. So to get to the different side of things, I said at the beginning that I asked the question, what sense does it make to combine protection for animals with protection for children, and what difference does it make? My answer to the question of what difference it makes has a lot to do with that reshaping of the idea of who can have rights and what the implications of that are. Okay, so I've already said they redefine uh, what qualifies you to have rights from being rational or property owning to being sentient or feeling being. The implications of that are that you can be a dependent, defenseless being and have rights, right? You don't have to be a rational adult. Um, you don't even have to be human. Uh, what that means in practice is that rights aren't just about liberty and freedom. They're also about protection, right? Because if you're going to give rights to dependent beings who can't take care of themselves, in order for that to be meaningful in the world, you're also going to have to say that you protect them, right? There's got to be some organized body whose responsibility it is to see that those rights actually uh, are instantiated in the world. And uh, so this is, I think, another important transformation in both the practice of kind of philanthropic organizations, but also the kind of theory of uh, rights in the United States. Um, rights aren't just about freedom, they're also about protection. That's one of the key uh, changes that I think this language of rights and these organizations make. So to return to this seal, you know, for 
this horse or these children to have rights, you have to have, you know, these interfering bodies uh, who are going to, you know, put themselves in between uh, a perpetrator and and his or her victims, right? So you need interference, you need protection. And I think that this leads to uh, the beginnings of new ideas about what the role of government can and should be, right? So the late 19th century period I'm talking about is often called the Gilded Age, right? It's the rise, the time when large corporations are being formed, Andrew Carnegie, you know, guys like that. And it's often known as a period of laissez-faire, of, of hands-off, no government regulation, right? But what I think these kinds of organizations are doing is working against that. You know, they're not talking about business regulation, but they are talking about what's the duty of the government to the rights of the defenseless, to protect the defenseless in their in their uh, in their rights. And they're saying the government has a duty, and it has to there has to be an arm that reaches out, right? that interposes here. And so you can't just have hands off and have a society where everyone's rights are protected. Sometimes rights mean hands on, arms outstretched, interfering. And so although they're privately chartered organizations, as I've said, they have these police powers and they call themselves the arm of the law and the arm of the state. So I think they begin to stretch the boundaries of government and of the state and of the sense of responsibility that there are towards the least. And those kinds of transformations are, I would argue, the lasting and most important legacies of this very strange kind of conjunction of animal and child protection. It doesn't last but I think some of those transformations in uh, the ideas about rights and the role of the government do last. And, oh, I didn't mean to do that. But I will stop there and leave time for questions. I have a microphone. If you just raise your hands, I'll try to make it around the room as best I can. Was it more than a coincidence that this came right after the Civil War, and, and did this relate to rights of blacks or, or immigrants and others? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, uh, I think it's not a coincidence. Um, the, the first animal protection societies are founded in England in the 1820s, um, the RSPCA. And uh, so there's animal protection going on before then, but the fact that it doesn't happen in the United States until 1866, right, right, uh, for Civil War ends in 1865, I think isn't an accident. And in fact, the set of ideas that I'm talking about, um, this idea that rights are based in feeling and involve protection, is borrowed by animal protectionists from abolition, uh, from the movement for the abolition of slavery. So I think there's a direct ideological link between abolition and animal protection. So yeah, not a coincidence. Um, the picture you had of the private police, I assume that's New York City. It is, yeah. Now, did that uh, type of protective society spread? Yes. Because you said that Illinois yeah. had the community. Yeah, almost everywhere that um, ASPCA's, SPCC's, sorry, SPCA's, SPCC's, or humane societies spread, which by the end of the 19th century is um, almost everywhere across the West, Midwest, East Coast, and a couple of places in the South. It's, it's a little different in the South. but. It's, they're very widespread. There's over 300 of them by 1908. Um, and the vast, vast majority of them, over 
of them have uh, are chartered in a way that gives them police powers. Yes. And that's true. That's still true in in some places that you know the animal welfare officer is uh, acts is deputized with police powers um, and but it works for the humane society. So that, that still exists somewhere, some places. Uh, does this movement have religious roots or is it wholly secular? Um, <clears throat> it doesn't have any direct religious roots. That is to say that um, the it doesn't grow, none of the organizations grow out of particular churches. Um, there are, however, uh, animal protectionists and child protectionists both uh, use a lot of religious language to justify what they're doing. Um, so animal protectionists um, go out of their way to find any biblical passage they can that supports treating animals well. So the fact that you're uh, actually supposed to let oxen rest on the seventh day and you know, give uh, uh, and this idea that you know God cares for all his beings, including the sparrow. I mean, there's a bunch of biblical quotes that they use over and over and over again. Um, there are some places where it's more tied to um, particular religious sects. Um, in Philadelphia, as you might imagine, um, a lot of Quakers are very involved uh, with the early animal protection movement, right? They have this nonviolent uh, mandate and so um, and, and many become in the 19th century vegetarians as well so you know sometimes there's that kind of linkage but there's not um, any kind of uh, usually any kind of in formal institutional link uh, I've been reading Oliver Twist so I'm wondering if there was any kind of combining uh, of animal and children protection organizations in England as well? There is not. So um, there, there, it, there does, uh, England does found, so in England there becomes a national SPCC, National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, and England is formed um, in the late 19th century after the first one in New York City is formed. So. You know, England is first in animal protection, and then later, after the U.S. Um, starts doing child protection, founds its own national SPCC, but they were never combined. Is, is one of the reasons that emerged after the Civil War was the, the emergence of the first American middle class and, and the diminishing of the frontier, so it basically wasn't simply survival concerns? Um, yeah, so the question is, does it have to do with the emergence of the middle class? And I think the answer is yes, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, so. Uh, to take the examples, uh, to go back to you know what I was saying earlier in in about what people thought animals and children had in common. So one of the things I talked about was the rise of pet keeping, right? And which is the kind of creation of a role for pets for animals that is uh, uh, kind of uh, equates them with children, right? In terms of their role in the family and the way they are are treated. Um, that's really a phenomenon of the middle class. Right, so you don't find a lot of working class people um, who are having dogs and cats around just because they think they're cute and they want to pet them, right, um, and take good care of them. So, um, uh, well into the 20th century, um, if you are working class, you still tend to have a much more utilitarian relationship with animals. Um, animals are a source of labor and um, possibly a source of income for you. Um, among the middle class, it's, it, it, pet keeping really takes off, right? Um, it's also among the middle class that these ideas about discipline that I talked about, the changing ideas about discipline, uh, first take root, right? I mean, they eventually kind of spread all over the place, um, but they first take root in the middle classes. So, you know, I do think that 
that there's an important way in which a lot of the, if I could go back and qualify all those things I said about what 19th century Americans thought, what I'm really talking about is middle class. Hi, I was wondering uh, if you could speak to this phenomenon as um, abuse of children as uh, kind of in contrast to attitudes around child labor, where it was the family who said, yes, the children should go work, and you had this kind of societal fight over the you know, the um, authority of the family mm -hmm. as being nobody's business? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the uh, question of child labor is an interesting one. The uh, humane societies and child protective organizations, it varies a bit from place to place, but they do not become part of the kind of national campaign against child labor. What they do, um, what they do uh, organize against are certain forms of child labor. So um, from very early on, in uh, the 1870s, as soon as the first SPCCs and humane societies are started, um, they really target um, children who work in the uh, as performers. So, um, children with the organ grinder on the street, children performing on stages, children performing in saloons, children working as acrobats. There's a lot of this in the 19th century. And um, the reason they do this is uh, that they argue uh, that the world of the theater and entertainment is an immoral and sordid world. Right? And so to bring children into this at an early age is to ruin them for life, right? Before they can make a conscious decision to go down this road some adults are making this choice for them. So that's the form of child labor that they really target. Now, you know, later in the, in the late 19th century, in the early 20th century, uh, the people who became become famous as opposing, you know, industrial child labor, like someone like Jane Addams, for example, they also oppose children working in theaters, and, and they believe the same argument about the... Um, immorality of it and also the kind of physical strenuousness of it. Um, but they don't, the, interest, the child protectionists do not take on, uh, by and large, in any kind of national way, child labor. But I think that um, the link that you identify or the, the phrase you used is kind of, you know, interfering in the family, right? That was one of the big debates about campaigns against child labor um, was, you know, don't par can't parents decide or can the state come in and say, tell parents what they can and can't do, right? So in important ways, what child protectionists are doing in the years leading up to the kind of formal campaigns against child labor is establishing that, yes, indeed, you know, you can make laws that tell parents what they can and can't do. Um, and you can create those kinds of regulations. So often in history, animals and people have been equated in very negative ways. Yes. Uh, and so were these movements ever used as ways to punish um, other racial or ethnic groups in terms of like taking their children away because they weren't being treated the way the white majority thought they should be treated? Yeah. Um, so, right, it, it's, um, there is a long history, as you say, of, a, of negatively equating people with animals, right? And that's, um, I mentioned before, that I, I think animal protection has ideological roots in abolition. Um, but what's interesting about that is that abolitionists were constantly decrying slavery for its equation of people with animals, right? So it's not abolitionists themselves who say animals are great and deserve protection, but it's the kind of logic of their arguments that um, animal protectionists pick up. Um, what you do find uh, with both animal and child protection is that uh, 
no surprise, those kinds of people who are most likely to be seen as cruel are, you know, immigrants, uh, African Americans, for those protection organizations working in the South, um, and, uh, you know, kind of the working classes in general. Uh, this is not, these are not the only groups that ever get targeted or prosecuted by animal and child protection organizations, but to be sure, um, to be cruel is to be barbaric, right, and to be uncivilized. And so in the uh, late 19th century, you know, you're more likely to be seen as uh, uncivilized and barbaric if you are outside of the, you know, kind of white middle classes to begin with. Um, I guess to piggyback on that, um, in regards to gender, um, you know, I know you use Mary um, Wilson's case, obviously a girl, but um, not looking at the gender of the child for protection didn't seem to be an issue thus far. You know, obviously it's pre suffrage movement. So what was, were there a lot of differences or was they seen as sort of a one, just all kids were the same? That's a great question. And, um, you know, I don't have any comprehensive statistics on the breakdown of, you know, what kinds of cases were picked up and prosecuted between boys and girls. Um, I should say that um, one of the things that happens as these SPCCs and humane societies get going is that they start doing a lot of stuff that we wouldn't necessarily, they start taking a lot of cases that we wouldn't necessarily define as cruelty. So I mentioned the child acting stuff, right? We probably wouldn't see that as cruel. Um, they also do a lot of um, investigation of neglect. And um, there I would imagine that the gender ratio of the victims would be pretty similar. What I know in the case of the New York SPCC is that they end up um, prosecuting a lot of cases of what we would today call statutory rape. Um, and, that, that's, and that's specific to girls, right? That's a crime that's understood as being specific to girls. There wasn't such a thing as statutory rape when they begin doing this, but they, are, they actually help get those laws passed. And what's interesting about that direction that they go in is that um, <clears throat> they don't seek it out, but it's really brought to them by people you know, from the neighborhoods of New York City seeing this as a form of cruelty and abuse, right? Um, and so they basically have to start dealing with it. And, and the more they deal with, with cases of um, young girls you know, being forced to have sex with older men, the more they come to think that you know, this is a, not only a widespread problem, but something that needs to be legislated about. And that's where you get you know, the idea of, of statutory rape, right, as opposed to, uh, and that, that um, is an important distinction from regular rape because it means the issue of consent is put to the side, right? If somebody's under a certain age, we just say they cannot consent. So you know, that's a case where there's a very girl-specific kind of crime that does become the target of attention. been talking about prosecution. Yeah. When does the wind shift so you get juvenile courts, abuse and neglect proceedings that attempt to iron out or remove children temporarily and then maybe reunite them with the abuser's parents, uh, however? Yeah. Um, so the movement for juvenile courts um, really takes off in the early 20th century. So, you know, a couple decades after all of the stuff that I'm talking about gets started. And um, it's, there are kind of glimpses of it in New York City earlier. The, the SPCC in New York City is really keen, for example, to, um, cause it used to be the case that, you know, uh, like Mary Ellen Wilson, when she's removed from her home, a child who was actually just a victim in a case would be held in prison awaiting the trial to serve as a witness alongside, um, 
you know, adult offenders and, and all this stuff. So they do some work um, to segregate children from uh, prisons early on, and then that really flourishes with that idea of completely separating uh, children from the adult criminal justice system really flourishes in the, um, in the movement for juvenile court. Now, um, some of the kind of stalwarts of the child protection movement don't like the juvenile courts because they don't like their focus on, they're part of a focus on uh, family unification that you start to see in the beginning of the 20th century, where the idea that these folks had that what you need to do is um, take children away from their bad families in order to protect their rights really starts to be challenged. Um, and so you get um, the emergence of the idea that the best place for a child is with their family, um, so you get the emergence of the social work profession, so this idea that you'll have you know, professionals helping the family to try to be on the right path, um, and that that's a better course than uh, removing children from their homes. We just have time for one more quick question. I'm, I'm curious about the role of property law in all this. I know property is a big, that's how animals are classified now and started with livestock, I assume. And I know it's a big thing with animal rights Speaking today. Oh, sorry. Um, that this is a big thing with animal rights today that people are trying to essentially say animals shouldn't be property because then we can get more protection for them. Yeah. So can you just talk a little bit about yeah. how that, what role that played in all this? Yeah, so the question is about what role does property law play in this, and that's an, a really important question because um, under the common law, um, you somebody could be uh, fined or prosecuted for going into the middle of Main Street and whipping their horse, right? But what they're, the, the, the crime that they're committing is not against the horse. It's against the public peace, and it's against the public order. So they're either going to be, they're probably going to be prosecuted for disturbing the peace. Um, and what's innovative about animal protection laws is uh, that are passed at the behest of the SPCAs and Humane Societies is that uh, they define the crime as against the animal rather than against the public peace or the public morals, which might be offended by a display of violence in the public square. Um, and uh, so, you see 19th century jurists in cases that are brought to the courts and in legal textbooks where you know, they're talking about these new laws, they are saying, well, they, this is what's innovative about them, and uh, the crime is irrespective of the property relationship between the perpetrator and the abused. So you know, I can be accused of a crime against my own dog, which is different, right? Um, before animal protection laws, the only way anyone could be charged with a crime against my dog was if it was somebody else who came and hurt my dog and therefore committed a crime against property, right? But this here is the crime is against the animal, not against my property rights in the animal. So that's an important distinction that is made. I mean, obviously, it didn't undo the property status of animals, right? Animals are still property. Um, but you're right that the relationship of a being to, the more a being is seen as property, the harder it is for it to have rights. And um, you know, people in the 19th century knew that, and it's still a problem. 